Tom Herman, Ohio State football. <laughs> figured I'd figured I'd get that out of the way first, Tim. Everybody good, we'll open it up. Go ahead, Doug. Second Doug, row right. Doug Harris, Dave Daily News, Cox Media Group, Springfield News Sun, and Camera for Journal News. Uh, <laughs> right well. That's freaking awesome, man. You're my new favorite. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. That's all right. Bill. I got a, I got a better one Doug. Okay. After the game, Urban said he didn't know how much the wind impacted uh, Braxton's throwing. He seemed a little wild at times. What were your observations? I, I didn't know either. Uh, after watching film, I, I think it certainly did. Uh, probably a uh, coaching error on my part in terms of maybe underestimating the impact that uh, it had. It didn't, although it felt gusty at times on the field, I think Obviously, the higher the elevation got, the higher the ball got in the air, the uh, the more it was it was impacted by it. So um, he didn't throw the ball particularly well, though, uh, intermediately either. And so uh, to say that that was the the to blame the entire uh, lack of production in the in the throw game on the wind, I think, would be um, a little bit overboard. But it, it certainly played a part. Do you see uh, fundamentally anything that was different than his previous games? Uh, no, not 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 terribly. I, I think he just w was a little bit off, and that that, that happens sometimes. Right behind him, Dave. Tom Irvin talks about uh, Jack Muir a lot as the most important offensive player of the team. Maybe on the outside, that might sound silly to fans, guys like Hyde and, and uh, Braxton. But what do you think he means by that? He kind of expand on his value. <coughs> Yeah, I don't. I think maybe the the public perception is I, I think they they really get enamored with skill position players and they they forget about maybe or or aren't educated on how you win football games and you win football games up front on both sides of the football and to have a guy anchoring our offensive line that is as, as experienced and as professional about going about his business and let, let's not forget he, he's a really good player too you know you, you can be all those things you can be a great leader you can be very professional you can be uh you know an anchor you can do, do all that but if you can't play well you know it, okay great you're a good kid maybe i'll hire you someday but uh the jack's got all those qualities plus he's a really 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 good player and and uh kind of glue that keeps us together up front What do you see in defenses now in how they're defending the read plays in the run game? Are they leaning towards stopping Braxton, leaning towards stopping Carlos, or are they not sure what to do? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a multiple, there's a variety of ways that, that teams are doing it, not just team by team dependent, but, but throughout the course of a game, I think teams have really gotten better over the course of the year and years, plural, uh, of having a couple different answers. I mean, it's like uh, going back and, you know, playing the old triple option teams in Navy or Georgia Tech or something. You, you, can't, you can't sit and play the dive the same way every time or they'll, they'll figure it out and, and, you know, rush for 500 yards on you. And the, the same is true for, for some of the stuff that we, we do and in, in we just happen to do it in the shotgun and some spread formations. So, um, Teams are switching it up, Doug. I, I don't know if, if there's a one more common than the other. Uh, to say that, I, that I probably wouldn't have researched it enough, but um, we see a variety of looks on, on it every Saturday. And how's Braxton at making those reads at the moment? Better. Better. I, I would, none of them, no quarterback is going to be perfect uh, at it, and so we continue to try to improve it. and. Uh, study, you know, each each snap is different. Each each time, I mean, it, it, you break it down into the just the the inches of a, of a defensive end or a linebacker's, you know, his steps and his eyes. Where are his eyes? How are his? You know, we're talking about inches and shoulder turn and and steps. You know, he took one more step in here versus one more step out there, and and so every time the ball is snapped is its own entity, and and so. I think he's getting better. That's probably a long answer to a short question. Getting better, uh, but still got some improvement to do. He's awesome. He's awesome. Again, I'm, I'm glad he's 
not blonde hair, blue eyes, because I'd, I'd be a little worried because I hadn't been home very much. But uh, <laughs> second row middle, Dave. Dave, back then uh, you were. <laughs> Uh, Tom, I want to get your reaction to uh, breaking some of the records that the 1995 Ohio State offense uh, set. Um, you guys have already broke the records in uh, touchdowns for a season with still three games, maybe four games left to play. Um, what's your reaction to that? I mean, that offense had guys like Eddie George, Orlando Pace, Bobby Boyne, Terry Glenn, and you guys are shattering those records. Um, your thoughts on that? Not to sound coach speak, but I, I hadn't even thought – I hadn't thought about it. So to, to give you a short – Answer, you know, I, I don't know. I, it, it probably something maybe we'll look back and uh, enjoy after the season. But uh, I didn't even know that 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 were all those things that you said were were even a possibility and or had been already done. I'll go in a different direction. Um, is it is it frustrating as well as you guys are playing that you guys are in the position you are in the BCS? Or how how would you describe the way you as a as a coach feel that you guys don't control your own destiny? I know that's a cliche. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I don't think there's any frustration because I, I think at the at the end of the day, you know, I mean, it was like last year. Everybody says, "Well, is there frustration that you can't go to a bowl game?" No, we knew we couldn't go to a bowl game in January. Okay, we we've known about the BCS for the last 15 years. I mean, we know that this is the system that we play in, and these are the the cards that are dealt. So it's it's really no has no bearing on how we prepare, how we play, how we, I mean, it to, and to waste uh, brain cells, as I call it, to waste brain cells even thinking about it or worrying about it would be brain cells that I can, I can use more, uh, use better to, to help the offense or help Braxton or be a better husband or better father or whatever the case may be. Uh, but it's, uh, it's out of our control, so we, we can just go win games and play as well as we can and keep getting better every week. Front row, Bill. Still reeling from that answer. <laughs> Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Yes. Um, coaches are never satisfied, but I would imagine this has been a, a very fun offense to be in charge of. When, when you look at this offense and where it is after 10 games, what improvement do you want to see the rest of the year? Where do you think you are right now? Uh, I, I still think we can get better throwing the football. I, I don't know that we're, uh, although we're markedly better than we were in the past, I, don't, I, I still would like to see us, uh, you know, make the easy ones easy and, and every now and again make the hard ones, uh, you know, make the hard ones become a reality. And so I'd like to see some improvement there and then, uh, you know, we, we've got to continue, I think, we're really good scoring in the first quarter. And, and so what I'd like to continue to develop is that killer instinct, whatever, the, 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 the pedal to the metal, the, the foot on their throat, whatever catchphrase you want to use of, okay, you're up 28 nothing in the first quarter, so what? You know, we, we had more three and outs against Illinois than – probably close to the entire nine games leading up to that combined. And so I, I think the good thing is that we've, we've got some teaching to do. You know, we scored 60 points at close to 600 yards of offense, and there's still a lot of teaching that can go on from, from that experience. Indiana obviously has struggled on defense. What challenges do they pose to you guys? Well, I think that the challenge is um, – Identifying what what they're trying to do defensively, I, I think they're uh, they have a little bit more of an identity maybe than Illinois. Illinois was was kind of all over the place, and that made some things challenging. So uh, we've got to identify what what they're trying to do. I think we got to handle their their guys inside. They, they've got some uh, two big old D tackles that are that are really really good players, and and uh, and then you know they're they're going to try to pack the box and play, you know, what we see almost on a weekly basis nowadays is everybody trying to pack the box but still play zone coverage behind it. And we saw it a bunch last year in the, the quarter's coverage. We just couldn't, couldn't throw it over anybody's head or didn't have the confidence to do so. And uh, so I think we've got to be able to recognize when things start getting packed in that, that we got to be able to, to make the play on the perimeter too. Todd Porter, Canton Repository, Maslin Independent, New Philly Times reporter, Gatehouse Ohio Media. Uh, 
Tom, is it? You're not my new favorite. He's still my new favorite. <laughs> is, is it, at this point in the season, when you look at week 10 and have you know, Braxton have you know, an off day, is that concerning to you at all, or is that just something that you know, quarterbacks do regardless of the time of the season? Yeah, I, I think it's concerning to the point that I wish it hadn't happened. Um, but concerning to the point where I think that it's a trend or a slippery slope, I, I, don't, I don't see that. I, I think he, he had a bad day, he had a bad day, and some conditions that were uh, less than perfect, and you know, we learn, learn from your mistakes and move on. And, and so I think if this had been a pattern over a couple weeks or throughout practice even or anything like that, then I might be a little bit more concerned. But um, yeah, the, the concern is certainly there because you never want to want a guy to play substandardly, um, but at the same time, I don't think it's anything to worry about in the future, not yet at least. Tom, I just wonder, you know, you came from two schools where if y'all just won, it was a big day. I mean, you know, if you got the six. Hell days, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what, what is it like to be coaching now at a place where you've won 22 straight, you score 60, and yet I know you guys dissect it as much as anyone else, but to have even national media, guys like us, still thinking it can be better. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, what, what is it like to be sort of under? You're saying at Iowa, I, at Iowa State, if we won a, if we scored 60 and had 600 yards of offense, we'd, we'd feel a little bit differently on Monday than we do at Ohio State? Yeah, I think y'all were, I think y'all were fired up about going to the Yankee Bowl. Or we absolutely were. Yeah. I mean, we threw parties and stuff, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know. I think as you grow in the profession, you just adapt to, to the surroundings. And so, um, it's, <laughs> As you had, as you had, is that is that Coach Bruce back there? Yes. <laughs> hey, and I'm all for Iowa State. I know you are, and so am I, and so am I. I, I had a great time there, um, along with Coach Bruce. But I think you adapt him to the to where you're at, and and but I think the thing that can get lost at times, and probably felt like, uh, you know, we had a really good season at Rice few years back and and uh, it started to be at the end of the year where winning was it felt like a relief and it wasn't uh, uh, an exaltation it wasn't jubilation it was a relief like whew, okay we won again and I promised myself after that season that I'd, I'd never take a win for granted whether you win uh, three to two or you win 60 to 35 or you win 76 to nothing the wins are really really hard I mean, really hard, and winning on the road is really hard, and uh, they're going to get harder as the season progresses. And so, uh, we don't ever want to take that for granted on how difficult it is, no matter who you play, no matter who you are. That winning a football game on Saturday and playing 60 minutes, and at the end of the day, looking up and having more points on the scoreboard than your opponent, is an incredibly, incredibly hard thing to do and should be enjoyed for the short amount of time that you can enjoy it and then start to prepare for the, for the next week. And then the other thing, I know every time I get, a chance I, get a, a chance I get to talk to you, I ask you this question, but people keep wanting to keep thinking they're going to see more and more of Dontre Wilson. And uh, first play of the game was a, was a little swing yeah. of him, which was overshot. And, and then was it because of the way the plays went out? I mean, y'all had, had several huge plays Saturday, which kind of took away from uh, yeah. the yeah, I, I think the the thing that gets lost in does Dontre deserve to play more? Absolutely. Was it an, an error on my part, maybe not to get him a few more touches? Sure, you, you can you can put that on me. But the when you're playing well offensively, and you have some seniors and some older guys that are, I mean, for every time that Dontre touches the ball. Braxton Miller, Carlos Hyde, Philly Brown, those guys don't. So I think you have to be smart about when and where that happens. Did we think we might need him more in the beginning of the year uh, to just win games? Yes. And so now we've got to figure out a way because the kid deserves to play. And the kid is a really good player. And so I've got to do a better job as a play caller and game planner of figuring out a way to get him touches 
but in the rhythm of, of the offense and not detract from some players that are playing really, really good football right now. All right, last question. Steve? Yeah, Coach, Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts and 24-7. Um, the, fir- or the third play of the game, you talked about the reads when Doug asked you about that. Uh, he fakes the give to Carlos. The guy crashes in, tackles Carlos, and keeps it. He makes two guys miss, and he's gone. Just what was the idea on that play? Is he is that a keep for him all the way, or is that a great read on his part not to give him the ball? No, yeah, yeah. He, he was he was reading the defensive end. The thing we hadn't anticipated was we were in our jet tempo. I mean, we were we were going fast, and and Indiana actually had a uh, uh, a check, I guess you will. I mean, they every time early in the game at least. Every time we jetted, they were going to bring pressure and, and play cover zero and, and try to try to stuff us up front. And so, actually, the guy that he made miss is one that we don't we don't account for. You, you know, you you you're usually if you see cover zero, you're going to check out of the play that was called. And but because we were in our jet tempo and they got lined up fast enough, that guy was was standing there. So he made a great read on the defensive end and. There's a guy there that's not supposed to be there, uh, or if he's there, we would have checked out of the play. And I mean, does what what I've coached him to do for two years, you know, and all those drills we do on how to make people miss, and I demonstrate and do all that stuff for him. And so he's he's starting to pick up, you know, he's starting to take after his coach a little bit, which is good.